short papers. Section 9. The Role and Deportment of Women. By Charles Henry Mackintosh. Better known as C.H.M. Scripture is very plain as to the place of the woman, 1 Corinthians 11 verses 1 through 16. We do not believe it to be according to nature or according to revelation for a woman to be prominent either in the church or in the world. It is our deeply cherished conviction that there is no sphere in which the woman can move with such grace and dignity as in the shade and retirement of the domestic circle. That she can prove herself the helper of the man in all good works. Home is preeminently the woman's place. The Holy Spirit has distinctly assigned her work when he declares that she is to guide the house. There may be exceptional cases in which the Christian female, having no special home duties, may devote herself to outside work with real advantage to many, but such cases are few and far between. The general rule is as plain as possible, 1 Timothy 5 verse 14. As to the question of woman's rights, etc., we have nothing whatever to do with politics. It is our desire to be taught exclusively by scripture, and most certainly we cannot find anything in the New Testament about women having a place in the legislature. In the history of Israel, it was always a proof of the nation's low condition when the female was thrown into prominence. It was Barak's backwardness that threw Deborah forward. According to the normal, the divine idea, the man is the head. This is seen in perfection in Christ and the church. Here is the true model on which our thoughts are to be formed. So far as this poor world is concerned, it is all in confusion. The foundations are out of course. God has said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him, Ezekiel 21 verse 27. There can be nothing right until the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Till then, the Christian must be content to be a pilgrim and a stranger on this earth, having his citizenship, his home, his portion, in heaven. May it be thus with all who belong to Christ. We do not expect that persons who are bent on carrying out their own thoughts, whose will has never broken, who reason instead of submitting to the authority of scripture, who say, I think instead of seeing what God thinks. We do not expect that any such will approve or appreciate what we have answered in reply to your question, but we must bow down to the authority of God in this as in all beside. You have our fullest sympathy in all your mental exercises. We believe you are absolutely right in refusing to be present where a woman undertakes to speak or pray in public. The spirit and teaching of the New Testament are against any such practice. Silence is enjoined on the woman in public or in the presence of man. As to 1 Corinthians 11, you have nothing about the assembly until verse 17 where a new subject is introduced, and as you truly remark, the Spirit of God cannot contradict himself. He cannot in one place tell a woman to keep silence and in another, tell her to break it. It is both contrary to God and contrary to nature for a woman to come forward as a public speaker. She is to illustrate the proper place of the church, subjection, not teaching. The church ought not, does not teach, she is false if she does. Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to teach. This is the spirit and genius of popery. To say that the church has power to decree, enact or teach is apostasy. The church is taught by the word of God. She is to obey and be in subjection. She ought to be the pillar and ground of the truth, to hold and maintain the truth, but never teach. Such is the invariable teaching of the New Testament as to the church of which the woman should be the illustration. It will perhaps be said that God uses the preaching and praying of women for the blessing of souls. Well, what does this prove? The rightness of female preaching? No, but the sovereign goodness of God. Were we to argue from the fact of the divine blessing, what might we not be led to approve? God is sovereign and may work where and by whom he pleases. We are servants and must do what he tells us. In the time of the awakening souls were smitten in Roman Catholic chapels in the presence of the sacrifice of the Mass. Does that prove popery to be right? No, it only proves that God is good. To reason from results may lead us into the grossest error. It ought to be sufficient for everyone who bows to the authority of Scripture to know that the Holy Spirit strictly commands the woman to keep silence in public assembly. And truly we may say, doth not even nature itself teach the moral unfitness of a woman's appearing in a pulpit or on a platform? Unquestionably. There are many and varied ways in which women can labor in the gospel without the unseemliness of public preaching. We are not told how those women labored with the blessed apostle, but most assuredly it was not by speaking in public. As to the four daughters of Philip the evangelist who did prophecy, it rests with the defenders of female preaching to prove that they exercised that gift in public. 
we believe it was in the shade and retirement of their father's house. In conclusion, dear friend, we express our ever deepening conviction that home is, preeminently, the woman's sphere. The she can move with moral grace and dignity. The she can shine as a wife and a mother to the glory of him who has called her to fill those holy relationships. There the most lovely traits of female character are developed, traits which are completely defaced when she abandons her homework and enters the domain of the public preacher. We believe it is plainly opposed to scripture for a woman to speak in the church or to teach or in any way to usurp authority over the man. But if there be a meeting of a private, social character, there is in our judgment an opening for the free communication of thought, provided always that the woman keep the place assigned her by the voice of nature and the word of God. Judging from the tone of your letter, we feel assured the Lord will guide you into the right path of service. We are not told in what specific way those women labored with Paul in the gospel, but we know there are a thousand ways in which a woman may serve in the gospel without ever stepping out of that sphere which properly belongs to her. As to the married woman, we feel increasingly persuaded that home is preeminently her place, that she has a hallowed and elevated sphere in which she can serve in the full consciousness of being exactly where the hand of God has set her and where his word directs her. May the Lord bless and keep you. Scripture is very plain as to the manner in which Christian women should be attired, not only at the Lord's table, but at all times. Surely in this, as in all beside, there is urgent need of the exercise of a tender conscience, a godly subjection to the authority of God's word. If Christians will not give heed to the exhortation of the Holy Spirit, they are not likely to pay much attention to these pages. One of the special needs of the moment is thorough submission to the true teachings of Holy Scripture. Where the heart is under the direct government of the word all will be right, where it is not, there will be nothing right.